Okay, so this is uh, the first episode of what I, I guess I'm just going to describe it as my non-BMX podcast because I don't really have a consistent theme thought up or anything. I just have been doing these BMX podcasts and I, you know, I know a lot of people who are, you know, uh, not at all related to BMX or in your case, Ryan Dennehy, you're, you have a, a BMX background, but I just really wanted to, uh, you know, have a little chat with you and talk about, you know, your success. And uh, I guess probably the most logical place to start is like, what was your original uh, thing that you worked on, like your, your involvement with BMX or mountain bikes or whatever in the beginning? Yeah, man. Well, thanks for having me on. Nope. This no doubt. No doubt. Fucking awesome. Um, <laughs> Dude, it goes, it goes way back. I mean, I started riding BMX when I was eight years old. Um, did a little bit of skateboarding, you know, this and that. But I uh, started getting into filming uh-huh. and thought that, you know, there could be a career there for me. And as I got older, I realized that, you know, there are plenty of good BMX videos out there, plenty of good skateboarding videos out there. Um, so if I was going to find kind of like my own lane and, and sort of build, you know, get some traction for my own work, I had to go find a market where there wasn't there wasn't already really good shit getting done. Like right. I could go out and actually make a name doing something different for, you know, people that actually wanted something different. Um, and so mountain biking was kind of a natural extension of that. And so what year was this that you decided that you wanted to try and uh, give us a shot? I was 16 and this mm-hmm. was like 2005. And what kind of 16 year old were you? Were you like clear, uh, how old are you right now? 28. 28. So you were like highly motivated from from a young age, or? Well, yeah. Okay. So that's that's kind of a tricky question, right? Because like one of those uh, like underachieving high achievers, right? Which right. I'm sure you were probably one I, of them too, right? Like familiar, yeah. Like when you're a little too smart for your own good, so then you <laughs> just think that trying is overrated. Like, right. yo, I could get an A, mm-hmm. but I don't want to because like my time is better spent doing other stuff. Yeah, you're um, a little too advanced. So it's just one of those things. Like I go and sit in class, and I'm like, oh man, I just want to. I want to go to the skate park. I want to film. I want to do this. I want to do that. And, you know, I would just sit in English class, stare at the wall, and just think about, like, an edit that I wanted to put together or whatever. So as I, as I kept filming and kept kind of, like, developing a style, I remember thinking one night, I'm, like, laying in bed. I'm 16. I'm, like, yo, I could probably, I could probably make my own video. Mm-hmm. Like, there's nothing actually stopping me from calling up every, you know, company that runs an ad in Bike Magazine, asking them to sponsor me, sending them a you know a tape and putting their logo on on the dvd you know rounding up the riders all that shit right like there's no reason why me as a 16 year old with my camera with my editing software can't just go do this and in retrospect were you highly talented at this or were you sort of green to the whole uh, media thing i think so i sucked at first like i was i was so bad that when i in my freshman year of high school joined the like film production club I like shot some stuff with my friends, and like two minutes into to putting it up on the screen, the older kids were like just kind of pulled the plug and just told me to, to get lost, basically. Really? I was like, all right, whatever, that sucks. So what they just didn't appreciate your work, or they didn't uh, like no, what you were doing. Like, yeah, who's this kid coming in here with his with his janky ass <laughs> camera, you know, with these kids on bikes, you know, doing wheelies or right. whatever they thought it was, you know, to them. So I just said fuck that. I left and uh, and just kind of got back to to doing my thing and, and filming. But, but you have the mentality of, like, learning about filming and stuff, or, like, we were motivated to get better and everything? Yeah, so, yeah. like, I would I would come over from school, I would I would pop in a DVD, and I'd look at, you know, what was being filmed, how things were edited, and I'd say, okay, I'm going to take the footage from my friends, I'm going to try to edit it the same way mm-hmm. that, you know, the, you know, back when the, the girl and chocolate, you know, skate videos were coming out, and, <laughs> yeah, and that yeah. stuff was popping off. It was like, how can I edit you know, emulate some of that stuff. And then I would go out and film and I'd say, okay, how can I mimic some of the camera angles that these like ski and snowboard movies are using? And so every day I would just like come home, kind of study the shit, go back out, do it again, rinse and repeat. So by the time I was like 17. And that's the mentality. That's where it's going to get you anywhere in life really. It's just that that training, that practice, putting yourself through it. Yeah, I mean, think about it. Like when you... When you first started the come up, yeah, right, like these years and years of just so you working went, your how, ass off. How long? How long you been running the come up, right? Like how Almost long you been writing years. on a website? Over nine years. Yeah. Ten years, right? Yeah. Okay. When you when you first started, did you ever say to yourself, did you ever identify as being a writer? No, no, not that's at all. crazy. It right? was just I had to do this. And to when get you got by, a, yeah, assigned a, an English assignment, what did you do? You said fuck that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was never. Uh, you know, I, I actually I recognized that I was talented at writing, or that that was probably where my skill set was. I'm horrible at math, but like okay with words but yeah that's uh that's exactly you know like when you started doing that you just wanted to create something you didn't know you just had the urge to make something out of yourself i think like right? like yeah because i would imagine when you when you were in middle school or high school 
you'd sit in English class and there were kids that were like, I want to be a good writer mm -hmm. and I want to be like Ernest Hemingway or some <laughs> you know, bullshit or yeah. whatever. You know, and guys like you and I would look at that and be like, that's fucking lame. Yeah. <laughs> you know? But that's the thing about writing is that you, you can't really write that well until you have something to write about or in, until you, you have right. a reason so that, to write. Yeah, you know? in the same way, that's how I felt about filmmaking. Like, I would, I would be in these film classes in school and these kids would want to be, you know, uh, Steven Spielberg and yeah. all and all this crap, and I'm like, I don't identify with that. Like, I don't, I don't think that's cool. That like, I don't, work on. I don't have a passion for that. Right. I have a passion to be like, you know, Spike Jones or like <laughs> one of these guys like shooting these these sick videos. And so, like, I found my way into the craft through my passion and something that had nothing to do with it. Like, mm -hmm. being into BMX, being into skateboarding, being into mountain biking, led me to becoming really interested in filmmaking that way not i'm into filmmaking and now i want to go find a subject to, right. to make it on and so. i think that's the way to go for sure in terms of just that kind of thing the, the one thing i thought that was really interesting was that you initially got rejected by everybody that you attempted to have sponsor your original video project uh how did you deal with that and wh what was that whole experience like yeah i mean that was that was a big learning experience because i think when you're <clears throat> I think having the having the completely uninformed optimism mm -hmm. of a seventeen year old is like one of the best things you can do, right? Like think about it, when you're seventeen, you you can drive. Mm -hmm. You can like you can talk to girls, you can you can do math, whatever, right? Like you're <laughs> yeah. you're basically like you're a young adult, so you're armed with all the shit to go out in the world and, and kind of be dangerous, but you have none of the experience to tell you that all the stuff you're doing is really dumb yeah. and, and likely to fail. Yeah. Right. So same thing with me. Like, I just had this mentality, like, why not me? Like, I can, I've got the camera, I've got the editing, I've got all the shit, I can go do this. Yeah. But I hadn't, I hadn't been kicked in the face enough times to know that, like, okay, if I How sent out all these. really done, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I'm coming home from school, and I'm, like, I'm burning DVDs off this computer in, uh, in my parents, uh, in the basement of my parents' house. And I'm going through every issue of, of like, Mountain Bike Action magazine mm -hmm. and writing down the name of every advertiser, calling them up, Asking for who runs their marketing department, and then sending this little tape in with a with a or DVD in with a with a sponsorship proposal, mm -hmm. and I'm asking for like fifty grand, like <laughs> a number so stupid. Like at the time, I'm like, well, that's just what I need to make the movie. Were you doing like any <laughs> research at the time to try to figure out how much you could potentially get paid by this? Do you remember? Uh, yeah, so like it went from like the first like five. I sent. I was so excited to do it that I like I think like Tioga, like one of the tire companies, right? Like I sent them something asking for like fifty G's. Mm -hmm. And then, like, I talked to a couple producers who, like, returned my email, and they're like, like, dude, are, yeah. you, are you kidding me? They're like, you might actually get a response because you're so out of the ballpark. Yeah. You know, and then I brought it down to, like, 500 bucks. Yeah. Like, all right, I'll give you, you know, if you give me 500 still, bucks and some still components. Still weren't too hyped on that, or? No, you know, nobody's responding. And then, <laughs> you know, so I do, like, literally, I mean, I would just have stacks of envelopes with these DVDs, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, send these things out. I'd follow up with calls and emails, and... And, you know, it's the bike industry, so, like, people were cool, and when they found out that I was young and trying to put it together, like, in most cases, it was, like, a really nice, like, yo, man, like, we just don't have budget for that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but there are a handful of companies that were like, yo, this is pretty cool, like, I think we're, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll send you a check for 500 bucks, we want our logo here on the DVD, we'll do this and that, but, I mean, yeah, the 70 I sent out, I had four or five companies that, that even entertained the idea. Right. Of doing it. And so, so, so what kept you from being completely crushed and just giving up at this point? Because that's obviously most people's reaction when they kind of don't get their way in business. Yeah, I mean that was probably one of the best, the best learning experiences that you can have at a young age is when you realize that the the things that you succeed at, the, like when you get what you want, that's just the byproduct and a smaller percentage of the things that you go after, mm -hmm. right? So it's like if you want to make, you know, a million dollars, you need to take. 10 million shots at yeah. at the goal or whatever right like if i want five sponsors for the film i've got to approach 50 companies right. to even have Easy. a shot at this right so like once you start to get an understanding in the same way that like when i was trying to learn how to kick flip on my skateboard or like even when i first learned how to do anything on my on my bike um first time i hopped off a little jump and did a no footer and just racked my nuts on the seat <laughs> yeah. which i think probably everybody had that experience at one point like just, yesterday yeah you know um once once I did that and realized it's like okay, I just gotta keep doing it and doing it and doing it and then I'll and then I'll nail it. It's just the exact same thing. Like anything that you're gonna do is just gonna be the product of rejection. Right. It's just gonna be some smaller percentage of that. And that's a big part of just being successful at all is just learning to be okay with with being rejected. When I look at my life before I started to come up and everything, and even since, I mean, there's been so many things that I just failed miserably at that I 
but I had I, I had the guts to give it a shot. Like when you say that you were just gutsy and you had the the, the gall to send out this thing and ask for fifty grand, it's like even though you might have kind of made a little bit of a fool of yourself at that time to like five people that read the emails, it's kind of yeah. like you need you need to be that kind of person who's willing to go out there and just try something. I mean, if you if you're not completely embarrassed by <laughs> your first attempt at whatever it is that yeah. you're trying to do, like you're not you're not trying hard enough. I mean, I don't know like what your first advertising proposals looked like oh, yeah. for the come up yeah you know or how you communicated on email to those companies <laughs> yeah, when I think about it. <laughs> i mean holy shit right yeah. like but so you ended up uh cutting a deal with the lizard skins where you you didn't actually get paid but you got promoted through their catalog right like uh yeah how did that end up going so that was that was like another huge turning point right because i got i got the sponsorship for the first movie and again i'm, I'm 17 so I'm, I'm over the moon that like these companies that i see these athletes you know wearing the logos and they have the ads and the magazines are actually willing to to even be involved in the project but then the the one big company that distributed all the dvds video action sports um they you know wanted no part of this they're right. like you know you just we don't know who you are you don't have any track record whatever so i'm thinking like okay well i'm gonna have to give all the sponsor money back if i don't get distribution because right. what i did i fibbed a little i said i had distribution oh uh, okay um, so this is another kind of common theme with <laughs> entrepreneurs is that they tend to have a, a to be able to justify taking you know, leaps with, with the truth. Every, like, to to spin a business the, a value out of thin air entirely right. involves skipping a few steps, right? And if you do it incorrectly, you're going to wind up in pretty choppy waters. If you do it right, it's just the way that you get the shit off the ground. I mean, you know, so in my case, like, the only way they would sponsor me was if I had distribution. Right. And I was like, well... Okay, so <laughs> yeah, it was obviously not I was like, happen, if so. I have to cold call every bike shop in America and make my own, I was like, my backup was I was going to start my own distribution company, and this um, ski ski movie producer named Josh Berman, he, I had talked to him back then, and he told me that's what he did when he couldn't get distribution. He just sat there for two months, and him and his brother cold called every ski shop really? in the U.S., and they moved like 10,000 units of their DVD or like something crazy like that. So I was wow. like, worst case scenario I can't get distribution, I'm going to form a separate company that looks like it has nothing to do with mine, and I'm just going to call all the shops and distribute it myself. So needless to say, uh, VAS turned me down, couldn't get the distribution. And then when I was pitching uh, Lizard Skins to be a, a sponsor for the movie, I realized that they actually ran their own distribution company. So they had their own warehouse in Utah. So they made their own gloves and grips and all the other stuff, but they sold directly to the shops, and they had their own catalog that the, that the shops would get. Right. And so I thought to myself, I'm like, all right, well, in theory, they could just add my DVD to their catalog as another product. So right. it wouldn't be like them getting in the DVD business. It's just like, instead of a new pair of gloves, we got this movie. Make it have no risk for them. No risk, you know, except for maybe a few grand to, right. to warehouse the DVDs. And in return, I'll give them title sponsorship of the film. Right. Right. And so, you know, one thing led to another and we got in this conversation and, and these guys are are really smart and... And they were like, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll do this thing. So we're not going to actually pay you for sponsorship, but we'll advance you the first $5,000 of anticipated revenue, mm -hmm. which was great because it actually motivated their sales team to get on the phone and try to recoup the five grand, which, look, nowadays five grand is just not a lot of money for, you know, you and I with the businesses that we run. Well, but if you're trying to sell mountain bike DVDs, it probably still kind of seems Five grand like is five grand. <laughs> it's yeah. probably a lot harder to make five grand Dude, when you, DVDs when you, now. when you're 17 and oh, a yeah, check yeah. for five grand shows up in your mailbox. That must have really uh, lit the fire under I you, I freaked huh? the fuck out. I was, like, <laughs> I was like, Mom, I need to go to the bank. I need a bank account. <laughs> like, let's go. And so were your parents surprised when you started to get into these sort of things? Did they know that you had a business mind? Uh, yeah, you know, I think I, they probably saw it early on. You know, like even when I was... Seven years old, and the and the neighbor kids had a had a lemonade stand down the street. You burned I, it down. I, no, you might. You, okay, <laughs> well, that's good. That's, that's you where you and I are down. different. Like you might you might have burned it down. No, what I did, I remember doing this. They um, I looked, and they were they were all there down the street. I just walked to the corner where all the cars would turn in on, and I just got a jug of water. I just started selling water for a buck. Right. They were selling lemonade for two dollars. <laughs> what, what I found is like people just buy stuff from kids regardless right. of what it is and as long as once the cars got to me they just give me whatever change they had by the time they got to the lemonade stand like yeah it was a better product but it's like i just gave the kid on the corner yeah my money I'm so yeah. no deals you know these these poor kids spent all day with you know mommy and daddy making the like little picture perfect lemonade stand <laughs> i just i just come in dude market dynamics yeah yeah right? i mean <laughs> I, I wish it was that easy that you could just walk down the street and be like oh, i'm gonna open up here 
they got I mean, the, I mean like four dollars, you yeah. know what I mean? But it was <laughs> like I think at that age, I'm like, I, I think there's, I think there's, there's, you know, always a play somewhere. When you uh, did that trade with Lizard Skins for distribution, did you feel like you? Like, was it hard for you to make that decision to kind of give something away for free? Because I feel like that's something a lot of young uh, aspiring entrepreneurs deal with in terms of internships and things like that. I think, I think it's, I think that's two separate questions, right? Mm-hmm. Like, in that case, it was just a, I think it was kind of a savvy business move because I aligned our interests, right? Mm-hmm. Like, by them advancing me the money, I got the cash I needed to buy cameras and produce the film and have some money in my pocket. Mm-hmm. But they now basically had a debt that had to get repaid to themselves. Right. So they had a, a motivation to actually go out and sell the DVDs. So the fact that they got their logo on the cover and all that, like that was that was just kind of part of the deal. I didn't really think about it that way. That being said, though, in terms of you know trying to get my foot in the door of other industries and doing work for free, and when companies you know would ask you to you know hey it'll be great exposure, but yeah. you know blah blah. I think it just it depends on your situation. Like, right. if what you have to gain from it, what you have to. We have to gain. What you have, but it's like if if I'm providing you something of of value that we can all quantify, and you're unwilling to compensate for that, and there's no real reason why I shouldn't be compensated for it, then then we might have an issue. Right. But I think what I've seen with with young up and coming entrepreneurs, or just anybody trying to get their career started, is people tend to fall into two camps. It's like the kids that are just way too eager to just give it all away for free right. and are just hungry, and just, but will just go way overboard with it. And then the people that are just too high on themselves and turn down opportunities, and they don't know a good one when they see it. Yeah. You know, well, the economy think, is so different now, too, where it's like if you want to be in a, a competitive field doing some kind of work for free is just inevitable. And a lot of the people, I think older people especially, don't really understand that. Like our parents' generation, them working for free, they didn't, it didn't add up to them. Yeah, so I think... Um, <clears throat> I think if you're going out trying to create something, like you just got to understand, like what what do I want to get out of this? Like, yeah. if I'm an up and coming photographer and I'm trying to get noticed and trying to get paying gigs, the best thing that you can start doing is producing work that's on par with those who are getting paid for it. Right. Exactly, you know, yeah. and then maybe you do some stuff for free to get your foot in the door, or whatever, right? But if you're if you have no experience, you've never been paid for stuff before, and your work isn't up to that quality, and someone's like, hey, you want to come shoot? you know, I can't pay you or whatever, and you're like, nah, man, I'm only doing it to get money. It's like, well, <laughs> yeah, you're yeah. kind of missing the point. Yeah, yeah. Um, at what point did you realize that the DVD game was dead and the digital was the future? I think... So I made the first DVD. That came out when I was 17 or 18. I was in high school, freshman year of college. Started producing the next one, and then around that time was when YouTube was invented. Right, okay. It's just like hard to imagine a time before that. But so like, what, like 2004, 2005? Well, I, I remember YouTube in 2004. That was when I first saw it, I think. Yeah, I think, so it was around that time where I just kind of started realizing, I'm like, there's just no way that selling physical copies of stuff is going to be... The future, or big, is, bigger than it is now. There's just no way, right? right. Like, Because I even saw it when, like, when I produced my first film... You you still had to upload like a QuickTime like an MOV file or like a W. Remember those days when like right click yep. save as all that all that crap. But I would look. I think I had GoDaddy for my hosting, and I would look at my GoDaddy reports. I'm like a DVD that sold four thousand units. The trailer w- was downloaded like two hundred fifty six thousand times. Really? I'm looking at wow. that, I'm like, huh? Yeah. I'm like, that's way better than. And then what kind? How, how many know? numbers of DVDs were you selling at the time? First one sold four thousand units. Oh, good. And um, so then, you, but you're getting a quarter. Just great, but the second views, one yeah. sold two thousand. Admittedly, it was not as good, um, but still, like I just. When you see the numbers, though, and you're like, well, five thousand people paid for it, but you know, a quarter million people are the potential audience. All all the other producers that I was talking to at the time in all the other industries, ski, skate, snow, BMX, everybody, even even the props guys when I first met them, and everybody was saying like, dude, you know. You should have seen it five years ago. We yeah. were really killing it, you know. And, it was, and I felt like every two years I was having this conversation, like, "Oh, you should have seen it a few years ago." Yeah. You know, I'm like, okay, well, I know when this starts happening that we're not, <laughs> we're not in a good place. Yeah. Um. Are you are you a person without a lot of regard for tradition? Because I think that's in terms of like writing off uh, the DVD thing early on, or like when I look at myself and the fact that I was, you know, really not concerned with uh, maintaining tradition and just wanted to advance things and do the website thing and just go digital. Do you identify that as a characteristic of yourself that you are not concerned with the old ways? It's got less to do with caring about the old ways and just being 
just unsympathetic, if that's even a word, right. to to just what what you just got to get done to, to get done, right? Like, right. you know, and we'll we'll get into this probably later in the show, but you know, my first or second company was acquired by a newspaper. Right. The most recent company acquired by a company that makes coupons, right? So like, <laughs> when it comes to tra- like, I know I know traditional businesses can be successful, right? Um, but just being honest with yourself about like what you know, where things are headed and what you need to do to just get get what you want, right. you know? Uh, another thing I saw that was kind of interesting about you is that early on, you seemed like you were a lot less focused. Like, you were doing a lot of freelance uh, consultation for a lot of companies along with doing the mountain bike coverage. You were in college. You were shooting music videos, which notably one of them was for Joel Santana, apparently. Um, what what was, was there a moment where you just decided, like, oh, I'm going to become focused. I'm going to really settle down on one idea or one or a few things instead of uh, being all over the place. Yeah. It, it's one of those things where you, you start and you realize you're capable of something like, okay, I put these DVDs out. People are willing to buy it. Um, okay. I can go, what else can I do that mm-hmm. I'm interested in? It was clear to me that making mountain bike films wasn't going to be this hugely lucrative, you know, it wasn't going to get me a private jet anytime right. soon. Right. Um, and so living in New York city, listening to a lot of hip hop music as you can probably respect. I was like, oh I bet I could, you know, take this and and shoot some rap videos and do it at a fraction of the cost that, you know, the big the big production houses are doing it for. So I started doing that. Then with the DVDs being successful, a lot of the sponsors uh of the movies were coming to me and flip the table. Oh sorry. A little, a little loud, yeah. <laughs> um were coming to me and saying, you know, why don't you shoot, you know, some marketing videos for the trade shows and and this and that. So when you work so long to just get recognized for something, let alone get paid for it, but just get get recognized for it, once people start coming to you saying like, hey, can you do this? Or yeah. I want to pay you to do that. You have this tendency to not want to say no because it's like, all right, well, three years ago, I was just sitting in my house like, in <laughs> yeah, high school yeah. with a camera teaching myself how to edit, you know? Um, so at that point, I didn't want to say no. So I took... You know the, the the BBC in London called me and said, "Hey, we need some some web videos for our our you know sports website. Can you produce that? Boom, done. We'll yeah. Do that. You know ESPN. Hey, can you give us some content for this? And so everything that was coming in, I was doing that. The uh, the stuff with the rappers ended up being a huge waste of time. Uh, <laughs> in, in what way was it not creatively fulfilling either? Uh, it should have been. Have you ever worked with rappers? Uh, not Joel Santana caliber rappers per se. So I don't I don't want to like make a blanket statement because there's definitely oh, some yeah. it's a to- some talented a toxic guy. type of person <laughs> like yeah yeah totally there's a very Dude, strange I mean, personality type yeah we would uh, there's this kid um, I got connected with um, Cameron's head of A and R this guy named Duke to God Duke to God yeah. through my friend uh, Stephen Hacker uh, who went by the name Spliffington at the time and so he connected me with Duke Duke connected me with Joel's and went down to the studio in New Jersey and. Um, you know, it, it, you're first kind of like starstruck, like yo, these these rappers that you know you, you're listening to, and and Jewels has his Rolls Royce and his <laughs> and his yeah, Bentley yeah. and his Corvette, all all of them white, parked out front, and right. you know, and he's got the big chains, and I think Lil Wayne was there one day, and you're just like, wow, this is crazy, you know, I'm there, I'm there, I'm just like skinny white kid. I had a, I wore a pink polo. I had the audacity to do wow, that. Wow, okay. I think I might have had one of those too. That's there's uh no, there's a picture of me on Facebook with with Jewels and I got a pink polo on. And it's it's super embarrassing. But, but what's uh, super funny is that if you didn't have a pink polo on, you probably would have stood out like a sore thumb. I mean, everybody was No, so cuz that was so I was I was like 3 years late. Oh, really? Okay. To that? <laughs> oh, yeah. They were wearing like they were wearing like Ed Hardy t-shirts with skulls and yeah, stuff. Yeah, that was that era <laughs> dipset. Okay. But, uh, that but was no, the man. era dip set where they would just let some random white kid do a video for him too. I think. It's like I think they were kind of open, you yeah. know, open to whatever. <laughs> and uh, yeah, th- and so then I met this kid Linnell, who uh, who now is actually a pretty successful rapper in his own right. Goes by the name Vinny Chase. Oh yeah. Um, so shout out to Vinny Chase. Um, but yeah, so he kind of he kind of like brought me into the circle briefly. He was shooting stuff at the time. He was a filmer before he became a rapper. Um, r- really interesting cat. But um, it was one of those things like we'd schedule a video, we'd go down to the studio. Right. And I'd bring all the equipment down, all the guys down. We're ready to do a whole afternoon of shooting on a Sunday. You know, and Linnell would be like, yeah, you know, Els ain't really trying to shoot today. Yeah, they're not and I'm like, through, yeah. But I'm like, Wait, he's over there. <laughs> he won't talk to me. <laughs> but uh, I think uh, you just kind of go through these, these 
times where it's like, okay, I can, I can accomplish stuff. I can do stuff. You try new things and like very quickly you realize like what sticks and what doesn't. Right. And you know, th- there's a lot of guys that just were so the allure of like, like rap music. Yeah. Or, hanging out around fam- famous people and shit just gets old, old real quick. Yeah. And I was like, nope, there's, there's no way there's, there's no way that this goes well for me. <laughs> uh, so I, I kind of pulled the rip cord on that. And, and then, I, and then I started looking around and realized I'm like, okay, the DVD market's not going anywhere. The this rap stuff sucks, <laughs> um, and even the freelance work it was a pain in the ass. Doing I the mean, consultations and stuff, or just consulting for companies and shooting content and all that. Like I have so much respect for for you can you can really build a healthy income and career for yourself as a freelancer. But every freelancer will tell you, and, and you, you know this yourself too. Like chasing companies for invoices and getting people to pay you, and then you got people you got to pay, yeah. and it's just. I mean, it's it, insane. yeah. And so I just thought, you know what? Like, this is just going to be a treadmill that I never stop running on. I'm just always going to be like booking new work, chasing people for payment on old work. And, you know, wh- what I really want to do is build a product, build an asset that has value greater than just what I'm putting in. Right. You know? Um, and I so guess that, that's a good way of putting it, too, though. Like, you know, you don't want to feel like you're just going in and doing a day's work. You want to feel like you're really building something and that what you're doing has like an exponential reach beyond just that physical labor. Right? Yeah. I mean like the the reality is unless you are a lawyer that's like top of his game rainmaker pulling in, you know, 5 million a year at some firm of which there may be a hundred of them in the world. Then or your hourly rate is never going to be that great. Or you're a hedge fund manager or yeah. whatever no normal person like you and I is really going to going to get rich or or just have materially the things that we want by just drawing down a salary right right and so what you have to do is you have to put work into something that is building something that's bigger than you mm-hmm. right and so like the stuff that you've done here like the website if all you ever had was just the website and one day you stop writing people stop coming to it yeah. and then the advertising dollars dry up but you've got a brand, you've got a store, you've got all, you've got an you're asset. Still building something. So yeah. every hour that you come in and you put work into building this brand and this audience and the product line and all this stuff, that's an asset that grows bigger by the day. It just inflates bigger and bigger, 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 bigger. Right. So the day that you step out of it, the music doesn't stop. It still plays on. It's true. You know, um, I did not think about it with that level of clarity yeah, yeah, at yeah. 19, that, that you know, 20. Time. But, uh, but, but without, but kind of, instinctually that's how i thought about it hmm. so then how do you get the job at banquet or what is the the banquet is probably the point that that most people listening to this are going to remember that's how that's how you and i met that's how we met yeah you know what was banquet and uh yeah so so banquet so a guy named rudd davis um who you know at this point he and i have been working together for almost a decade now he he had graduated from college um gone out to la he was you know a big big skier and and mountain biker and all that stuff and he was looking around and realized that like about half of all dudes in the U.S. would go on ESPN, watch ESPN, go on the ESPN.com, whatever. The other half never tuned in to any type of major league sports. Uh-huh. And so he was thinking, he's like, where are these guys? Like, what are they doing? And what he found was that if you looked at skiing, skateboarding, mountain biking, BMX, surfing, moto. Combined, MMA, there was a big audience. Com- that's where the other half of the U.S., male adults are right and so his belief was and all this stuff was really fragmented so he looked at sites like yours he looked at production companies like mine and he said these are all kind of like like cottage industries right or at least they were at the time if i built a company and a platform we pull it all into one place which is where the name bank we came from getting everybody kind of at the same table uh-huh. together right if i pull everybody in the same place we could have an audience that rivals espn mm-hmm. right and it, it makes sense right i mean you hear that and you're like yeah, no shit. Right? Yeah. That's of course that's a great business. And so you, but you weren't in on the ground floor. You like came and met with him soon yeah. after. No, so he he started it right after he graduated. He he raised like two million dollars from investors, and him and all of his homies uh, from college moved out to California, and they just started hitting up every action sports video producer on the planet. And right. so so this was the the summertime my fr- my freshman year of college. So I got a call from these guys. And I'm like, wow, I have dollar signs in my eyes. This is right around the time where I'm like, DVDs are bullshit. Like, I got to right. find some digital stuff. So these guys come riding in with their VC money. And I'm like, oh, man, this is going to be amazing. And they're like, yeah, you know, we got, like, all the biggest movie producers on board. And, you know, and I'm just like, I can't believe you're calling me. You know what I mean? Right. Like, they didn't know I'm like, you know. And what, they just thought of you as a content guy? or 
Yeah, they just said they made a list of the top 10 video producers in every sport. Uh-huh. And they went vertical by vertical and they contacted everybody. And so I was, I was like honored. Like, right. you think I'm one of the top 10 mountain bike video producers? All right. <laughs> Um, and so I was like, oh, this is dope, right? So we started working together and, you know, six months later, we've been we're doing, I've been helping them produce content. They fly me out to California and it becomes pretty clear that like none of the other action sports producers really wanted anything to do with them. Oh, okay. So the rest of them sort of knew. They were like, yeah, dude, every, everybody's hired. And then I get out there and I'm like, oh, wait a second. No, that's yeah. why they're so hyped to work with me. It's like everyone else basically told them to fuck off. Uh, okay. But these were rad guys doing a rad thing. And it's like, in hindsight, obviously, like everybody was making so much money on the DVD. You benefited that, from being not as, not quite as jaded as everybody else. Yeah, I was just like, yo, I totally get your vision. You know, let's do this, mm-hmm. right? Um, so, yeah, I mean, one thing led to another. And I, I, once I went out there and saw what they were building and saw that it was really the future and that I could have an impact on it... Um, I said, all right, yeah, I'm ready to, to join forces. So I sold them the assets of my production company in exchange for a position as a director of business development to basically help them lock down all the content they were trying to get uh-huh. to build the site. And so was this intimidating for you at the time to sort of go into a role where you were one of many in, as opposed to just sort of running your own thing? When, if you're lucky enough to get a seat at the table. Yeah, yeah. You should just sit the fuck down. Yeah, that's totally true. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. and I think because I had, you know, from the age of like sixteen up till that point, till I think it was only like twenty at that point, things were just happening, and I just hadn't like the world hadn't really smacked me in the head enough. But right. I had enough people, even at that point, kind of pulling me aside and be like, "Bro, you have no idea how lucky you are. Right. Just like, calm down." And so, like, did you perceive Banquet as being a content company or a platform? Like, what, w- what was it really supposed to be in its early days? And then when did it pivot? And when did you really figure out that it was going to be something else? So our whole thing was like, let's just be the ESPN for action sports. And so, I think so. You were like, let's make content. And we'll figure out the business side. Of yeah, we'll, we'll acquire the content. We'll produce it. We'll we'll do whatever. But but we're building this badass technology that can house all the content in one place. We're building this website that everybody's going to go to. It's going to be great, right? I mean, think about how every idea that you hatch with your friends sounds amazing. Right. And it never survives first contact with real life. <laughs> yeah. Even if it's like, yo, we're going to go to the bar, and there's going to be chicks, and it's going to be <laughs> awesome. And you get to the bar, and there's no chicks. And what was like, your reality check? Like, oh, it's insanely hard to produce high-quality content. Oh, my God, dude. Really it, give a shit about Not only was it so expensive to produce at oh, the time, because yeah. this is back when, like, you know, you had to have, like, a VX2000 or a GL1 or whatever. I mean, it was before, like, the DSLRs and everything were right, ubiquitous yeah. and GoPro. So, like, I mean, you had, to, you had to come correct with your equipment, and it was just a different time. You just couldn't, you just couldn't crank out tons of high-quality content. It just was not, not the move. And then the other piece was, like, we just severely underestimated what it takes to build a consumer product. So, right. like, building a platform that can house all of this stuff is one thing. But then building a brand that people are going to care about and go to. To give their content to. Out especially of thin when, air that yeah. like a consumer is going to wake up and, you know, we just were totally off base. Yeah. It was the right idea, but like not. But you were a bunch of tech guys or a bunch of entrepreneur guys. Not you, tech guys. <laughs> oh, not tech enough? Yeah. We had some great tech guys working for us. Um, no, I mean, we were just, you know, business guys, young business guys that had ideas. But, I mean, we just didn't really know what we were getting into. Right. Um, so you started off really uh, enthusiastic about Banquet. What was it like when you started to think that maybe this wasn't going to work out uh, the same way? So there was, there was never a point where we thought it wasn't going to work out, but there were definitely moments where we said, like, I think we're fucked. Okay, but before, you know before I mean? we talk about that, we should talk about the acquisition because it wasn't owned by uh, Gannett, aka for people who USA don't know, Today. USA Today. Well, no, so this happened before. So oh, it started. You started <laughs> to think it was failing before the acquisition. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what happened was like we come to this realization. We're like, yeah, we had so we had this office in Pasadena, right? Rudd was like twenty five. I'm, I'm, I think I was just old enough to drink at this point, and like, and you know, we have a full editing suite. We have, we have all these tech guys building the site. We're, you know, we're doing all this stuff. So we're burning through cash. Like $2 million goes fast when you have a whole payroll. Tons of people and, I mean, and tons of content to buy, yeah. Totally. So, um, and, and these, these investors that we had were, were real hard asses. And they just came down to Rudd's office one day, and they're like, hey, man, I uh, think it's time to burn the village. <laughs> wow. And so were you a little shocked I, by I wasn't there, phase? but I, I, go, I go to his office, and Rudd's like, 
He was like, close the door. We got to talk about some stuff. And I'm like, I'm like, oh, dude, I got this content meeting I have to go to. He's like, we don't figure this out. You're not going to make it to the bathroom. And, and you, <laughs> had, had you, you probably hadn't even considered that this was an option. Was like, oh, this is all. I'm just like, oh wait, oh place. yeah, this could all just, just completely just poof, you yeah, know, into yeah. thin air. So and you're I'm young like, enough that you hadn't probably thought about that too much. Yeah, right? I'm like, oh man, okay. I'm like, so lay it on me. He's like, listen, man. He's like, we got like six months of cash left. There's no way these investors are going to give us more money, and you know, I don't know where, where this stuff's going to go. He's like, there are hundreds of websites that make action sports content and they're all really small. None of them are big enough right. to attract at the time, you know, the Gatorades and the Mountain Dews and the Toyotas of the world to advertise on them. So he's like, without actually spending any more money, we can use the technology we have. He's like, I need you to go out and learn everything there is to know about an ad network, everything there is to know about grouping a bunch of sites we don't own together and presenting that as one entity to an advertiser. Yeah. And that'll be our business. We're going to become an ad network. You just, just figure it out. And and were you shocked and appalled by this because you were sort of concerned with content more than? Not really. I was. Just, I, I mean, I guess it, like looking back on it, I should have been like, "Oh my god!" Yeah, this is a very drastic change. Yeah. <laughs> What's happening? <laughs> uh, no, but I was like, I was like, "All right, okay, cool." And then I just like went back to my apartment in Koreatown and like just looked up like what is an ad network on yeah. Google, you know? Um, and you know, went from there. And then I showed up. I showed up at the Interbike trade show in Vegas and whenever that was, September, October of that year, just because like the bike industry was one that I knew from the mountain bike mm-hmm. stuff and, and, and just, just knowing shit about BMX. So I went to that. I, I mean, I wasn't even old enough to drink. So I went to Interbike with a fake ID to go to try to sell the stuff. Right. You know what I mean? And then, and then Rudd was like, I'll keep the investors at bay. And I'm going to go hire a CEO that's a badass that'll make this shit look real nice. So he went out and he used the last little bit of cash that we had and hired the head of AOL Sports to be our CEO. Right. And that worked out. That was, that was a, you described this as like a really good move, right? <laughs> Who was the other guy that they hired too? It was another guy. Uh... The, the head of ad sales for um, uh, Free Skier and Snowboard Magazine, uh, this guy Luke. So he moved out from, uh, from Colorado and started, you know, selling the ads against the network. We were, I mean, we, but like in three months. So we went from like, we're fucked, it's over, to now we're really fucked as once we actually started trying to pull off this like little pivot. To, right. Okay, we're getting some traction, we're signing up some sites. But you noticed that it, it was going to work, you just didn't have the money. That I mean, I don't know, because it it's like... good, though. Or at least a little. Someone, someone tips the hourglass over. Yeah. Right? Now yeah. you got this much time. It's kind of like losing your job, and it's like, okay, I ran out of money in three months. So you gotta figure something out. <laughs> let's yeah. make this happen. Yeah. And so, but you guys had some success with going out and scooping up a lot of sites. Yeah, such man, as it got, to come up. it was cool. It got, yeah, it got big fast. And that's, and so that's how we met. Yeah. So, you know, I was going out emailing every, every website on the planet and, uh, yeah, one, uh, one afternoon, um, I think I was home from college. This is like August of whatever that year was. Oh, seven. When we met eight years ago. Uh huh. Because I was sitting in my bedroom at my parents' house in Connecticut, and I think you were sitting in your bedroom at your parents' house in New Hampshire. Or in Brooklyn, probably, at this point, yeah. I don't think you had moved yet. I, no, I moved when I was, like, 18. So. Oh, you did? Yeah, yeah. Okay. In Brooklyn. In my the room. story I'm sounds better, myself, though, when yeah. we're both sitting in, in our New parents' Hampshire, houses. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was in Brooklyn, but I wasn't really in Brooklyn, because it's not like I was doing anything Brooklyn-ish. I was just sitting in my room, updating the come-up nonstop. But that's when, when you and I first talked, you were like, you were like, yeah, like, I don't want to join the network, but, like, Tell me how to sell ads because I'm selling these things for like two hundred dollars. Like, what do I do? And yeah, I'm like, I was trying I don't to figure know. it out. Oh, it was. I'm so acting like I knew what I was doing. I'm like, I don't fucking. Know. It was so confusing at that time, and you guys were in a good position because there were probably tons of websites like mine where now it's like I kind of get what it is to run a BMX website, but at the time it was like, how the fuck am I going to make money off all this? Yeah, pages? but there, but there were a lot of guys that were beating their chest and that, were, that didn't want anything to do with us. I mean, it's just, right. it's kind of like turned over a bit, but. Um, but yeah, I mean, your stuff, you still had, you had the cat on the homepage uh-huh. and, and all that good stuff. I, I think you actually had a photo of a, of a DEA seizure of bricks yep. of cocaine. Because a lot of people don't get that, is that the come up originally as a name, it was just kind of like a joke rap reference, in, implying that, you know, sort of comparing, uh, you know, gr- growing in the BMX industry to selling drugs. So that's why I think our original banner had like, of kilos of cocaine on it, and I love that. I, I recognize that immediately. A lot of I was like, I like that. didn't really, yeah. And this was so long before I ever thought about trying drugs. I too. I wore my come up snapback that you gave me like five years ago. Okay, I wore it to Coachella two years ago, and more people because people wear all sorts of crazy shit to Coachella. More people came up to me and were like, "Yo, where'd you get that hat?" 
Damn, that's tight. I gotta go to Coachella. With I didn't. I didn't some actually. Merch on. I didn't really like have anything to tell them. Like, oh, it's this BMX <laughs> website, and they're all like, oh. <laughs> I thought it was something cool. See, with, with OSS, <laughs> at least you could be like, oh yeah, it's a store downtown. Go check it out. That sounds way sick. When I was telling my friends today, I'm like, yeah, he's got this store, at, like DTLA. <laughs> it's called On Some Shit. Everyone's like, yeah. That's always <laughs> very confusing. You know, what's the consistent thing is like, I'll be in here editing at night with all the, the lights off, and I'll just hear people outside going, On Some Shit. <laughs> oh, I like that. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> like old ass people and shit. Um, so where were we? Uh, you sell the USA Today. How did this this opportunity come up, dude? I mean, it was just it was one of those things. Like we we were on the brink, like staring down the barrel of a gun. Like again, like yeah, we, we have X amount of dollars left to last us. Let's try the hail mary, and like you just kind of get tunnel vision at that point. Like whatever it is that we do, we can't. Like that's when you learn to stop making excuses. Mm-hmm. So like I don't know, you know if you've ever been in a position in life where you literally like, it's really easy to sit there and and make rationalize why you can't get something done. But Mm -hmm. like when you actually have no other option, that's when you really find out who you are and what you're capable of. And like that, that was kind of the position that we were in. So the ad network grew pretty big. We start pulling down some clients. We get this big time CEO and then USA today, you know, USA today sports was a big, big business unit for them. And they were trying to figure out digital and, and this and that. And they came in and they, you know, they made an offer and they made that offer like right before Thanksgiving that year and, and New Year's Day it closed. Wow. That was crazy. I mean, uh, you know, 20, at that point I could drink. So yeah, 21, like, you know. Um, so are you rich all of a sudden? Like objectively? Are you and all your friends rich from this uh, purchase? Or was it kind of like they bought it because you guys were fucked and they... No, no. So they didn't know we were fucked. I mean, oh, that was okay. the, our investors and our C- I mean, they did it. They did a great job. But, you know, being being young and raising that much money from investors at the time, like, I mean, they own most of the company. Right. But, you know, that being said, like, when, you know, all of us were in our early to mid-20s, when you get, you know, a solid paying job at a publicly traded company, right. still running your own business, yeah. I mean, even if you're not rich by normal standards, you feel rich. Yeah. You know what I mean? It doesn't and take much when you're 20. And you were the 22. youngest executive in the history of the company at the time, right? Well, so that title was first held by, by Rudd, the founder of Bankwit. Right. Because he came in as president of Banquet and ran this unit as a division of USA Today Sports. So at like 24, 20, or no, he's like 25, 26 at the time, he became the youngest executive in the history of the company. And then he got promoted a year or two later to become uh, the vice president of USA Today overall. Right. And then I came in as vice president and general manager of, of the Banquet Group at 24. So I beat his record by like a year and a half. Wow. But I had no context. Oh, okay. Like that—that that was the—that was the shitty part, right? It was, it was like you were sort of starting from scratch in a way, like uh, no, no context. Meaning, like, had this company, sold it, we were dead. Then we built it, and then we sold it, and then now we're here. So, like, and then like seeing him become like take on this thing, like youngest executive in the history of a hundred-year-old company, and then and then that torch gets passed to me. I mean. Y- you kind of have, like, a fucked up world view because yeah. you're like, all right, well, I'm just the man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so did you do anything, like, egregiously stupid at the time or anything, you pick up any bad habits? or? Uh... Um, no, I mean, initially, no, because I was so underwater. Like, I was so out of my league, right. as I'm sure you found at any stage. Like, yeah. what was it like when you opened this store? I, mean, it, I was asking you before the show, so like... It wasn't that bad because Alfredo has a shitload of experience with doing okay. bicycle retail, and uh, Rob has a ton of experience with doing fashion retail, so it was kind of like, oh, I'm in the hands of people that like actually really know what they're doing, so that, that wasn't too bad, but I totally know what you're saying in terms of you were just... Completely underwater. And were you working your ass off to try to catch up or to try to show Yeah, and it was one of those doing? things where it's like, I just didn't, I didn't ask for help enough, and I didn't, I just didn't know to take a deep breath and and really start with the big problems i just mm-hmm. thought i could just do everything right, right. so <clears throat> it was bad but then but then as time went on and i'm making more money and starting to get the hang of things all of a sudden and then i started advising some companies on the side right you know then you know i, I met all these these guys in new york i'm out in new york all the time so then i get an apartment in new york you know and, and was that, that that was a big step in terms of just like oh i have a, an apartment in the two biggest cities in america then this is this is cool yeah yeah, and I'm like, and I'm fucking crazy because, <laughs> you know, now it's like Friday afternoon. Like, I knew I knew it had gotten completely out of hand when, like, I went out with, like, all my homies. And I lived in Santa Monica. I went out with all my homies on, like, a Thursday night. We stayed out all night at, like, the Brig or some stupid bar down there. And, um, you know, get an hour of sleep, wake up, go to work, leave, get on the airplane, fly to New York on Friday afternoon, 
go straight from the airport, you know, to some bar in the Lower East Side at like midnight, show up, ah, Saturday night, go out with some girl. We get hammered. She gets up and runs a New York City marathon the next day. Wow. I get up, do like a Sunday fun day with my friends, get on the plane, get upgraded to first class, start getting, you know, getting drunk again. And I just remember sitting at my desk in LA the next morning, going like, this is kind of a lot. Yeah, this is a lot <laughs> to like, handle. Like, this is like, like, I'm not a math guy, but like the numbers don't add up it's here. It's hard to do the work and then also take in all the things that are available to you once you reach that point. Yeah, and when, I think when you don't have, like if you're, like this is a quote from Wall Street, like a, a fool and his money are lucky enough to get together in the first place. Right? <laughs> That's pretty good. Yeah. And it's kind of like, like I was lucky enough to get there uh-huh. to begin with, um, but not having context and not necessarily always having a ton of, like adult supervision around me, what ended up happening was, and my my good buddy Scott Britton always tells me this, he's like, you see athletes, you see musicians, artists, whoever, business guys, and they have their first big hit, their first big success. But then then the follow-up usually isn't so hot. Right. You know what I mean? Well, like, it's like the first album is where you talk about everything that's happened in your entire it's tight. life. And the, and the yeah. second album is, oh, this is me dealing with being famous all of a sudden. And it's like, it's not inspired. It doesn't it's always work garbage, out. garbage, right? Good. Because yeah. normal people don't give a shit about what it's like to be famous that much because it's it's not relatable, yeah. Or when, the, when you know, pro athletes just start doing blow all the time and, yeah. you know, whatever, crashing Lambos and stuff, <laughs> right? Like, it's just not... Uh, and and it, it all comes down to one thing. Mm-hmm. And it's... Oftentimes, when people have their first big success, they stop doing the things that oh, made yeah. them successful mm-hmm. in the first place. Right? And that's a, is it's that really a big takeaway for you in yeah. terms of that whole period of your life? It's really obvious when you look at it, but it's like, I don't care if you were like a janitor and all of a sudden you get promoted to an office position, right. and then all of a sudden you're going to happy hour all the time and showing up hungover the next day. Like, it's the yeah. same shit. Like, the things that got me to that point, that got me the two apartments, that got me the first class Working your ass off and sitting in the office all day. Yeah, yeah. and it was like, I knew when to party and chill. But for the most part, it was like staying focused and keeping a level head, surrounding myself with good people, all the stuff that people are going to tell you to do. But very quickly, you just kind of get unmoored from reality and you're like, ah, the rules don't apply to me. And then, <laughs> you know, so there was a, you know, I eventually kind of, when I left the USA Today, like com- just completely, you know, turned the shit around. And but you it's had to stick around for like two years after the sale, right? Something four. Like that. Four yeah. years, okay. So typically, so when a company gets bought, there's yeah. typically a thing called an earnout. Right. So what will happen is if somebody came in and said, hey, we're going to buy on some shit for $10 million, they'll pay you like five up front. Right. But then they'll pay out the other five over the course of two, three, four years after mm-hmm. to make sure that you and your team stay on and and kind of seamlessly integrate it into the and make sure it just keeps growing and does all the things they want it to do. Right. So we had that at USA Today. So that there was a two-year earnout, and we we hit all the goals and all that, but... We were so young at the time and just kept rising within the company that we that we stuck around, you know, ultimately for four years. And was it tough to stick around for four years? Like, did you did did you feel passionate about this? Did you lose confidence in the business at some point? Yeah, I mean, I think I think after four years anywhere, I mean, like, look at look at the graduate graduation rates in colleges, right? right? Yeah. Like that fifth year, that victory lap, especially big. with the technology startup, because four years is like the entire market changes so much that, I mean, it must have just seemed like completely different yeah for you but it's like it, it was changing so often and, and we just kept taking over bigger and bigger pieces of the company it was it, it just like kept us motivated kept us excited so it right. didn't it didn't it like it actually went by very quickly uh-huh. and then once you know and then once we left we're like yeah man we actually were there for kind of a while like, that was a long time well what made but you want to leave we got to a point where it was like really clear that like big seismic shifts were happening in the company like, it just wasn't gonna i think in any any situation you're in for long enough there comes that point where you're like, I'm either in this for, for a while, whether it's a relationship or whatever. Like, I'm either in this to, to win it for the long term. Yeah, I'm either like, doing this till I'm dead or I'm gonna have to. You know, pick something and, and else. you got to have some really strong convictions in that. You know, or you got to get out. I mean, right. and that I mean that kind of applies to anything. Like, I knew this girl in New York who was like in her like eighth year of college, but really wanted to be an interior designer, but was like in her eighth year of like psychology school and like wouldn't wouldn't drop out because she's like, well, I've already, I've already been in it this long. And it's yeah. like, that's a sunk cost. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's done at that point. You know, yeah, so yeah. we didn't really hold anything sacred. We're like, look, you know, we're, we're too young for this. I was 26 at the time and Red was in 20 or 29. And so let's go start another business. So how hard is that, though, when you go and start a, a company from scratch after not only starting your own company that was successful, but then also working at one of the biggest companies in media? I mean, 
Was this a hard decision? You want to go to like if you want to go from from hero to zero, yeah, really yeah. fast. Like leave a cush corporate job where you've got a big title, and go start a company that no one knows what you're doing and why you're doing it, and like everybody like, thinks you're crazy when you try to tell them what you're doing. It's one of those things where it's like, hmm, how quickly people forget. <laughs> you <laughs> yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, like yeah. once they didn't have the the VP and the job title and didn't have the USA Today email address, like did you feel like your your social network took a hit? As in, like people didn't want to answer your calls all of a sudden because I mean, like you had less power. Like in in, in business, yeah. I mean, <laughs> like yeah, we we rolled out of there just so hot to trot. Like, oh man, we're gonna leave. We're gonna raise a bunch of money from investors. Like, no problem, right? Yeah. And uh, and it's just not the case. And what? So you did you get investors right away, or uh, I guess probably the more important question is how would you describe to the the layman out there what exactly this next company you started was? Yeah. So we we left. We Rudd and I left. We thought that there was a huge opportunity with there being you know five million uh, small businesses and retail stores in America that if you could have something as simple as Google Analytics for your website to tell you how many people are coming to your website. You can't run a website without this stuff. Right. You've got to be able to do that for like a restaurant or a clothing store or whatever. Right. And that stuff just didn't exist in a way that any, any, any business could use it. And we sort of came up with that idea just being in the online media space and looking at analytics. And we thought like, hey, this, this could be like a pretty cool thing. So we got to start this company. And the problem was like, we assumed that because we had started and sold something and worked at a big company and it was successful, that we had automatic credibility. Mm-hmm. But the issue was we weren't really a known quantity to all the investors we were going out to. Nobody really knew who we were. So and even they don't we care had, about content businesses, which is what you started too. It's just such a different field doing a, a Yeah, people just didn't know who we were. So it's like, yeah, cool, you sold that thing and like yeah, I guess, you know, you've proven something, but you're like not a total idiot, but what else do you have? But about? Yeah, yeah, we we don't know who we've never heard of you before today. Yeah. And you're going into a completely unrelated field. So, you know, and, and it was just, a, it was, I don't want to say it was a disaster, but I mean, we, we thought we were going to get funding like that. And right. we spent, you know, we spent six months just, just really slugging it out. And, and that must be incredibly difficult because you're, you're building like a very expensive, intensive product, like a, an app or a, exactly what it You're means. building software platforms. You're, I mean, you're doing all this stuff. Super expensive, super difficult. And, it, you know, at the same time, like, Anything that you're going to do, I mean, this this was a, a huge thing for me, too, because we had gotten so caught up in, like, making a nice salary and, right. and having nice things and, and But all of a sudden, it's like, there's no money, and there won't be for It's a like a little long morphine time. drip, yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, hey, like, I get this fat paycheck every month, and I can drive a whatever car I want, you know? And, <laughs> and, and we got so used to the just, like, the little, like, level up, level up, level up that we weren't really thinking about what I was talking about earlier, like building equity in something bigger than you. And what that takes is usually a tremendous sacrifice. Right. And like, there's this like romanticized kind of image of the entrepreneur, like the sleepless nights and like the late nights in the shop packing boxes or whatever. But it doesn't seem romantic when you're in the middle no, when of you're, it. When you're doing it, you're like, this sucks. Yeah, yeah. It's this always fucking terrible. That's a big thing I've realized in my life is that the, the really cool parts that I'm going to tell people, oh, I was a part of this or I did this, is like you never really know until after the fact that that time period meant a lot or, wh- or what was valuable about it, I guess. You you remember it fondly when, when it's happening, but yeah. it... Or no, you remember it fondly in hindsight, but when it's happening, you're like this, like the sacrifice is crazy. Like if you ask anyone who's saying like, I'm going to go start my own business, I'm going to go take chances and take risks. And it's like, cool. You want to stop driving that BMW? You want (laughs) to move from a nice apartment to a shitty apartment? Like nobody really, like very few people actually want to give up what I would consider to be kind of trivial things to go after a much bigger dream. And so like, like compounding the fact that like, all of our assumptions about the investment money we were going to get was completely wrong. Right. And it was way harder. Like, I got accustomed to a pretty nice life. So, like, unload the apartment in New York. Get, get rid of my car. Like, really? Everything. Stop spending money on shit, you know? I literally, I switched to an outfit of just wearing a black T-shirt and, and black sneakers every day and only that because for a little while, I couldn't afford to, like, do, like, launder nice clothes. Right. Oh, there you <laughs> go. Okay. So I was like, I can still look fresh without actually having to spend any money if I do that. Like, I mean, that's, like, really what it came down to. And did it occur to you during all this that maybe you just wanted to quit or maybe it wasn't worth it? Maybe yeah. it wasn't going anywhere? If, if you don't think about, like, you can't wake up every day and be like, oh, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. But, like, if you're not really sitting there going, like, what the fuck? Then you're probably not being <laughs> realistic. You're not trying hard enough. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, you, if you had, you had these experiences where you're just like, of wanting to give up. 
or maybe not wanting to give up, but just like this is really hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've been there. Yeah, the giving up thing has never been an option for me because it's just like literally, I've nothing, what you do. nothing else going on. Like there's yeah. nothing else that I could possibly do. When did you start to see the bright side? Like when did you start to feel like things were going all right? Were I mean, we we just developed like, and as I'm sure you have, and like anyone. Anybody that, that just works really, really, really hard and takes a physical and mental beating mm-hmm. day in and day out, any any rough and tough soul, you know what I mean? Like, you you just kind of develop a resiliency. So, like, the bad days don't really seem that bad. You just right. kind of drive home and you're like, oh, all right, you know, and you, and you move on. But um, once we had a chance encounter with this dude, Anthony, that does investments for Nas, the rapper. Right kind of chance encounter with him he liked the idea Nas became Nas came in and actually put a big slug of money into our first round of funding and then my guys at flight club um who were an early customer of ours they came in and invested some money and then Brian Lee who started legal zoom he thought you know and so then and then gradually we just started getting momentum and you know really what that taught us was like you come in every day and you just keep slugging away don't do the same thing every day and expect different results, but you keep slugging away and just keep turning over, flipping over cards. Like eventually something's going to happen, Did you know? It. And that's when it, and then boom, we raised a million bucks and we started hiring people. We got an office, you know? And so at this point, uh, did you were, you, were you sure all along that you were going to be acquired rather than building your own independent company? When it, when it comes to, you know, the, the difference between a startup and, and a small business is that, Startups are built explicitly to take an idea with a really large opportunity mm. and scale against it really fast, right? right. So, like, um, whereas a small business is just, I'm going to start a business that makes money in, in a market, however big or small that might be, right? right? So, and the thing is, high growth companies tend to get acquired because if I'm competing in a market that's this big and I go from nothing to owning 10% of it in a year, well, logic dictates that i'm gonna own like all of it five years <laughs> yeah. so any company that has an interest in this market is gonna come in and say i'm gonna take you out right now at a hefty premium so that i can have this especially right? when the like now the vc field is so big that any startup that shows even a little bit of promise it's all of a sudden you know it's a target and it, it just so, so yeah it doesn't doesn't mean you're gonna get acquired you know it's, right. it's by no means a sure thing i mean but at least you know there's interest and at least you know that if your idea is really great, then Twitter or Facebook is right behind you, and they're either going to start their own or, you know, and realistically, there's probably going to come a point where you're not going to be able to compete. Or Google. There's, there's only two routes to go. You either, you either, you know, if, if you have a successful company, whether it happens in a year or 10 years or 20 years, you, you either sell it or you go public, you yeah. IPO on one of the public markets. Um, IPOs are exceedingly rare just because you have to be a very, very large company. I mean, you have to build a billion-dollar business, mm-hmm. you know, or thereabouts um to stand a chance on the nasdaq but if you can get even halfway there usually you've built a sustainable large business somebody's going to be interested in buying but you know we didn't we didn't look at it like hey let's go start a business that we can go sell really fast it was like let's build a business and see what happens let's go build a business as big and bad and as awesome as as we think we can build it right um and so then you get this big investment from Brian Lee and Nas and everything. How long did it take before uh Groupon came calling? Or were they, were they Oh no, th- this is one question I want to ask beforehand. When you started Swarm, this is the app that we're all talking about, or the the company we're all talking not, about. Not not an app though. Not an app. Foursquare okay. has an app called Swarm and it, Oh, and this is this is a new thing for you. Yeah, no, yeah, Swarm which was our company is just analytics for retail stores. Okay. So they kind of they cause confusion. Were there a lot of other uh competitors in this in this field when you entered it were there a lot of other people who had a similar idea or anything close to it yeah there were like two or three other companies that that all started around the same time which is weird because there wasn't like it's, us, it's funny how that usually happens huh in the you just like world. independently come up with the same idea a lot of people in, have this yeah idea. um but they were all going after like big enterprise side like the walmarts and, and and all that stuff and we were the only ones focused on small business um one of those companies uh, ran out of cash and got acquired for a, a you know a pittance right. um, last fall. Another one is either out of money or seemed to be out of money. So I think we, I mean we we were the only ones I think that really survived, and and we we actually were the only successful ones. So how did you space. feel when you when you learned that there was a, an acquisition offer? We I mean initially we didn't really want to ha- have anything to do with it because the company had grown so fast in two years. 
you know, we went from me and Rudd sitting in his garage in San Francisco, no health insurance, no heat, just like, you know, just sitting there trying to figure it out to, you know, close to 40 employees and, you know, multiple offices and thousands of customers and millions of dollars in bookings, you know, very, very real business. Um, we were going to go out and actually raise another round of financing, um, probably somewhere north of $10 million and, and really try to try to make this a big company and that's kind of like the classic silicon valley cliche sort of is like i don't want a million dollar company i want a billion dollar company how did you reason and decide like all right i'll take the million dollar company yeah i mean um you just get to a point where you have to look at like what do i want to get out of this right What's the and rational? like when we when we started this we said to ourselves we want to build a company that you know, we want to build a great company but what is a great company it's a company that that you know our customers our employees our investors and ourselves all get something out of right. from an experience from value monetarily all the above and when a company comes in and, and and makes an offer to acquire you you have to take a look at it and say does this how many of these boxes does it check off right, right. and so we just sort of looked at like okay we could raise more money which you know even if we do that, there's no guarantee that the business is still going to be successful. It just right. buys us more time to try to build it bigger. Or we can become part of a much larger company and the employees get this. The invest, you know, and, and so we started doing the math and we're like, this is a fantastic outcome. And it takes all the risk out of having to continue to try to build it right. any bigger. That's dope. Um, and so then w was there any reservations about Groupon being the company that wanted to acquire you guys? For people who don't know, Groupon is... The, the startup that sort of made a name for themselves doing like the daily deals thing. Yeah, if you don't know Groupon, you're a weirdo. If you don't like, know Groupon, you are a weirdo. <laughs> you know but I mean? we have a lot of weirdos who watch this stuff. So I whether to whether or not you use it, like you know right, what it is. Right. But well, I, I, you'd be surprised. There's a lot of 15 year old boys out there that probably don't even have emails watching this. Yep. But uh, and good for them. Yeah, they, they're lucked out in some way. But so you're their you're their only connection, only voice of reason to anything to reality. I I, I could take credit for that. Scary. When you when you get hit up by them though, like. <laughs> What are you thinking? Like, because well, so it, it seems to differ a bit from their so business. So but. right now, the big startups that everyone's talking about is you know it's it's Uber, it's Airbnb, it's Pinterest, it's you know, all this stuff, right? But but Groupon was the big dog. Groupon was one of, the, of like the last kind of wave of, of of those big companies. But but here's the thing: is like they're a huge company. Mm, they still do good business, even if they're not they growing as much. They right? did eight billion in bookings last year. They have twelve thousand employees. They have offices in forty seven countries. And is the vast majority of this because of the daily deal thing, or yeah, they, yeah, yeah? It it's not. It's not daily deals now. It's just. It's just a marketplace to find deals of businesses in your area. They have a few other lines of businesses. They do like discount travel. Also, but they've like they've turned it into a company that a lot of people are like, oh, I don't know what they're doing. To like, this is a this is a company that's valued at five billion dollars that throws off thirty million dollars a month in profit and operates in 25% of the countries in the world covering 80% of GDP. It's a huge company. And we didn't know that, right? So, because we were kind of like, ah, you know, group. once we saw how smart the people were that worked there and how big of a company it was, and we're like, wait, so you mean to tell me that we can be a part of this and still build our <laughs> shit? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it must have you been kind of weird, too, just because if you're caught up in like the tech news cycle that you see how certain companies become heavily criticized or whatever, and there's not a lot of correlation between their success a lot of times right yeah who cares right you yeah. know i mean we, so you know we looked at it and we're like this is, this is an offer that's gonna that's gonna do right by our employees our investors us everybody it's a great fit for their company like you just got to know when to you know we looked at it like this is let's do this in comparison to the banquet acquisition was this uh the the moment where you made enough money that you could tell everybody to fuck off or no no, yeah, I mean, so one, I definitely can't can't comment on like the the details of the transaction, but right. but yeah, I mean, in short, it was it was it was life changing, right, for sure. And so, but now, uh, did, did being a bit older, did you uh, handle that better than you handled it when you got the life changing amount of money earlier in your career after the banquet acquisition? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. You're I mean, a lot like, more adult about <laughs> it. <laughs> I, I feel like you know if you if you if you make it even to thirty. You know, and you the kind of guy like, like we are. It's yeah. like okay, you 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 learn along the way enough to stay alive, right? But you can afford to do your laundry now. Yes, that's tight. I got laundry in my place. Wow, same actually. Which, point, did, yeah. which I didn't I didn't have till like I moved into my new place in I think February, right. and like being able to just like pick up a laundry basket 
walk to the other room yeah. and put it in. I'm that like, is, yeah, that's true. As when you I'm have not, to walk <laughs> three blocks, it's like it's a horrible experience. Or to the basement in your building with a roll of quarters. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, yeah. Like, it's like I'm not wearing this shirt again. I'm putting it in the wash. So wait, what's your day to day like now? Like, do you do you work for Groupon? Do you still like completely in charge of uh, the stuff with Swarm? Yeah, or? yeah. So we've been really fortunate. They're they're awesome. We um, uh, my co-founder and I, we've got you know a, a handful of years that we're you know kind of locked in to to do stuff for them and the rest of our team same deal there so you know my my daily routine hasn't changed too much i mean when when we were running the startup and really trying to do all this stuff like you you kind of start with a plate that's this big and you put so much more on the plate than you can handle and right. it's like okay well a normal person would take things off the plate right but when you're in charge of your own destiny you just got to make the plate bigger right? right so my daily routine you know when Swarm was an independent company was I would wake up at 5 a.m., run two miles to the gym, lift, even though it doesn't look like it, lift for like 40 minutes, um, be in the office by 6.30 in the morning, uh, work from 6.30 a.m. to 8.30 at night, and then run three miles home. Wow. And then actually, it, I, can, I can work my ass off every minute every day, but I, I can't fit the working out in. The, the working out was the only way I stayed sane because yeah, like it helps a lot but i couldn't i realized that like you can if you drink a whole pot of coffee like throughout the day you were saying this was your affliction for a while huh? dude your 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 mind will just just turn into just a shit pile like right. it's yeah i've got buddies who work at hedge funds and they're like oh yeah it's when you pop and i'm like i don't know what popping is but like if it requires a whole pot of coffee that sounds terrible <laughs> You know, but you just, w the point is like when, when you're, when your back's up against the wall and you've really got to get a lot done, you've got to find a way to just make your bandwidth greater to handle all that stuff. So I just, right. I developed this kind of like bone crushing routine of like working out twice a day. So I would like be up early, get this time and to do this stuff, have the physical energy to do it, working out again at night to blow off steam and clear my head and then, you know, kind of rinse and repeat. So sounds good. Now, yeah, now, yeah. now a group on like the, the the hours aren't as yeah are you a nine to five guy now roughly no i mean i would say at least i would say at least three days a week i still try to get up at five five thirty the difference now now that i have health insurance is i actually skate to the office oh nice um so you're very logical that you would even consider the health insurance thing when you decide that you're going to skate there because most of my friends are the types that would you know, they jump off buildings with no health insurance daily. Yeah, so. man, dude, I, I get it. I just, like, <laughs> it's no, one of those things, like, the more, more you think about it, you're like, this is, like, this is a bad idea. Yeah. Anything I'm doing, like, no health. Like, you break an arm, it's, like, 20 grand to yeah. put it, you know, put it back together or something. So, anyway, so, yeah, I mean, I pretty much, I try to do that now. The, the problem with, with waking up that early is that by, like, Eight o'clock at night, you're not very yeah. you're, you're cashed. Your eight o'clock is very different than everybody else's, yeah. So like even even today, for example, like I woke up, woke up super early yesterday and and kind of did that whole thing. But today, knowing I was gonna come down here and shoot this, like the condition I'm in at eight o'clock, if I wake up at five, yeah. I can't go on air like that. I can't do this, right? Yeah. So I slept till nine and then just worked all day and then came here. So like I, I like now I try to balance it out a little bit more and. Recharge my batteries. See, I, a bit. I know I'm crazy because I'm listening to you talk about getting up at five, and I'm thinking like, oh, that's good. I should start getting up real early. And then I remember that I go to bed at four every night, so that would be, it'd be very hard to manage the two of them. But you got to find like you, you find a routine that works for you, right? Yeah. Like I, I sleep like four a.m. to ten a.m. usually or nine a.m. But that works, right? That works. Like from and, and you run your own show here, and the shop doesn't open till later. Like you can do that. But I could also like come in the office, get everything done, go home and sleep for a half hour, and then like like that little tiny twenty minute nap is like. It saves me so much in terms of just resetting my brain. I can't nap. I, I'm trashed after a nap. Really? Yeah. yeah. I'm super good at that. I love it. Yeah. How how has your routine changed as you, you know, being more of a kid living in Brooklyn, screwing around to, like, now with all this to support? It's different because, well, but I still find a way. Like, I still force myself to go riding a lot. Like, I really try to not blow off riding more than a couple of days a week and, I mean, in Brooklyn was different because you're just riding around 24-7, and, like, out here we have a van. We throw everybody in the van. I, I guess it's different, too, because I'm just so much more focused on creating content and creating stuff for our YouTube and shit like that ra ra rather than when it was in New York, it was more just we'd just hang out all day and maybe you film something by accident. You film a couple of clips here and there. Yeah. And out here, it's much more like... Just me being older, I'm just more focused on like what I want to like, actually accomplish. And There's a lot of hanging out in Brooklyn. Yeah. It's all, it, riding BMX in Brooklyn to me was like go to the Brooklyn Banks, 
nine o'clock at night and hang out till three in the morning and ride some shit. You Did know? you ever meet this guy, Anson Wellington? I know Anson Well. Yeah, when you mentioned him, I uh, I thought that was pretty funny because he was always one of the mountain bike guys that would hang out with BMX guys in New York. So that's how I met. That's how I met Worms. Right. The first time I met Worms. So. Uh, did, did your, your audience knows who Worms is? Oh, yeah, he's yeah. still in it. Yeah, yeah. Anybody so, who's not a piece of shit. If you don't know who Worms is, you should probably <laughs> turn this off. Yeah. For, first time I meet him, I walk into whatever shop he was working at at the time in the city, and he's listening to this band called the Mars Volta. Mm, yeah. Bat- he was always like a real hardcore indie head. Like knew he was in like, bands, knew about his like of bands. Prague indie. Yeah, you know, yeah, and the yeah. Mars Volta was like Rage Against the Machine meets like Incubus when they would do like weird solos and shit. Yeah, but like yeah, way totally. weirder. Well, it was at the Drive-In. That was their their follow up band, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and so I walk, I walk in the shop, and he's like, he's just like, like throwing shit in the air and spinning around, and you look at him, he's like this huge black dude with these dreads, and you're yeah. like, yo, what is, what's this cat on? And he was telling me the story about like, I mean, him and his whole crew, they would just hang out at the banks all the time, but he was telling me the story about how he was he was riding to the to work one day, and a cab t bones him in the intersection, really, and he fucking breaks the windshield, <laughs> rolls off. And just kind of shakes it off, and the cab driver is so freaked out, he just like peeps in the window, and he's like, "Yo, man, give me a ride to work." <laughs> wow. <laughs> so that's total, amazing. total non sequitur, but there's a, just a worms story to. Well, it's good. I mean, that's a little street <laughs> cat right there. You know about worms, yeah. Um, yeah. So I don't know. Like, what's your what's your mentality like these days? And do you think that are you gonna have to to commit again to another startup, or do you feel like you've kind of like gotten a lot of those wild oats out of you? Definitely not. I mean, if it, if it you know, 28 or 30 or even your mid 30s, you you think you're done. Yeah, yeah. With anything, then you know that's uh, it's, just, it's just weird. Yeah, right? yeah. I don't know. Um, it's uh, the way that I think about it is like having having done this a number of times now. Like, I've been given at least somewhat of a gift. Like, I can at least acknowledge that now. Like, this is so, like something you must be talented I, at. I can build companies out of thin air that are worth something to other people, and like it wouldn't be fair to me to my family to my friends to be like, I'm just going to retire on an island. You know what I mean? (laughs) Like I've been given this ability to create abundance for myself and those around me that to just, to just stop anytime in the, in the next two decades seems like really just kind of giving everyone else the shaft, you know? And I love this stuff in the same way that you love what you do. It's like, it would be, it would be hard. I mean, even, even over the, over the holidays, I took the first like, like two week break I had taken in a while after two weeks, I'm going crazy. Oh, you know weeks. what I mean? So yeah. If you put me alone for two weeks without work to do, I'm gonna read like every book in the library. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna come back with like a million business ideas Nerd. Like, sketched out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm gonna just do everything. Like, I don't know. Um it's it's funny when you say that because we talk about M M&M a lot here and I remember that I was listening to a podcast recently where they were like, uh, you know, why does Eminem still keep putting out albums after all these years? He doesn't need the money. He loves what he does. And it's he has probably hundreds of people that are making a living off of him from the touring yeah. and everything else. It's like his friends and his family are probably like largely employed by him. And at a certain point, it's kind of like, well, you're, you're acting on behalf of the clan as well, I guess. Dude, if you have the ability to, to create stuff that is <clears throat> produces an outsized return that can benefit those around you, like keep keep doing it yeah. you know because if you weren't in your shoes you would hope that there was someone like you to to be there for you you know totally and uh, this is another thing i was interested in though and this might be a, a good way to sort of wrap this up because we've uh, passed the hour 15 mark but oh shit i know that now all of a sudden you're doing a lot of like blogging and teaching and you're working on a book and stuff is that because you've accomplished a lot financially but you you maybe I, th- I think a lot of people once they accomplish a lot in business they start to look at the world and they're like well I want to make a difference. I want to contribute more rather than just creating technology or creating money or creating yeah. businesses. Is that what that's all about when you find, because your time is very valuable and to spend it teaching or, or writing, clearly you must care about. We're doing this. Yeah, we're doing this. There you go. So it's, uh, there, there's two pieces to that. So, so one is <clears throat> when you spend 10 years writing blogs, you spend 10 years starting businesses, you, you develop skills that not a lot of people have mm-hmm. and you develop a really nuanced opinion about the way things work that is just enjoyable to share you you build and you create all these things you you just want to get it out and right. share with other people so almost in kind of like a like a self-serving or selfish manner you're like like i have all this stuff that other people don't have and like it would just be nice to share it and and it's just intrinsically rewarding um to do that and then you know i think i think the other thing is you know when you wake up in the morning whether you realize it or not like we're on the planet to just be happy, right? right? Like you do things that make you feel good. That's why we. That's why we do this stuff, right? And the more that you can, 
like this whole concept of like what you put out, you get back. Like the more, the more generally you give to others, you're gonna get back. Like if I'm having a shitty day, but I make like I crack a joke with the chick at Starbucks and like <laughs> I call my sister, I don't talk to her enough, but I should, right? Whatever, and and she laughs and make her smile, whatever. All of a sudden, my day turns around like that, right? Right, and it's like these little things. So, anytime that I can just take something that that I hold kind of near and dear to myself, even if it helps one other person, like there's some weird way the universe just sort of kind of giving that back to you, and that's that's pretty fucking cool, and it shouldn't be underestimated. That is cool. What's the what's the book gonna be about? It's gonna be about. Uh, I don't know if I should share that quite yet. I, I wouldn't blame you at all. You if know you what? Yeah, let's. It's uh, interesting though because you swore off DVDs at a certain point ten years ago, and now you're digital entertaining the book idea, which is of course you know, digital in whatever form it takes. There you go. People yeah. need content. <laughs> oh, you you're gonna that. go digital only? I doubt I it. Don't you're know. gonna want to. Oh, you're gonna hold it. You want to send your mom one in the mail, right? Maybe I'll start a blog. <laughs> you already another have a blog. one. A better one. Double XL. Yep. That, I should, we should throw that in there. I mean, we could. We'll probably put that in the description like crazy and everything anyway. But. uh I don't know. Is like there anything else that you really feel like you wanted to talk about, or anything that you you want to accomplish? Anything you've been working on on the side, dude? I think uh, I think we've covered a lot here. I just hope that uh, you know the the come up cats out there really you know appreciate this or get something out of it. Um, I'm high. It's, it's yeah. a little bit out of the ordinary, but uh, I think but it's, it's been really cool. You know what? The reason why I wanted to interview you for anyone who stuck around to this point in the interview <laughs> is that. I did that one with Adam LZ, who's like kind of a love that interview. That was oh, awesome. you watched that one? Yeah, right, yeah. Cool, yeah. I mean, he's like a low level. Or did you know, he get uh, really sunburned that day? Oh, we was both did. Yeah, yeah. I and, like, and I don't yeah. think I color corrected it either. We were both so sunburned. It was like eleven. We've been filming all day. I was like, there's no way he normally looks like that. <laughs> we were both so disgusting. Actually, he does have skin condition as well, so that's what you know. Oh, way to call him out. <laughs> no, he knows. He's, he, dude, that's, I know he knows. That's the funny thing about him is he made a fucking blog talking about getting on Accutane. Like he's he's weighing the pros and cons and talking about. It. That's how open he is about his life. He's oh, just, make, that shit makes you a psycho killer. Yeah, no. Yeah. no, no, that's what a lot of people were warning him in the comments. Is like you're, it's a steroid. You're gonna go crazy. This is bad news. You know, I don't I don't personally know. But anyways, well, not yeah. that. But but interviewing him, it just made me kind of like, well, you know, a lot of people were inspired by that one. Who do I know that's successful? Ryan seems like a good candidate. It's got the the BMX mountain bike tie in and everything. And I don't know. I, I I'm I'm happy on how this went because I think a lot of kids out there. They, uh, we've grown enough of a following now that I think they'll kind of watch me interview anybody. It doesn't have to be somebody they already know about. So hopefully that's what I want to do is use this platform to kind of be able to talk to the kids and show them more and show them that they can accomplish whatever they want in their life or at least to show them a bit of the pathway to do that. And you're a pretty obvious example a couple of times over. So I really appreciate you coming through. And uh, how can people get in, get in touch with you if they want to stay up on what you're up to? Uh, just go to my website, uh, DennehyXXL.com, uh, D-E-N-E-H-Y-X-X-L.com. There's a lot of good articles on there, uh, kind of tech stuff, stuff about self-improvement and how to keep your daily routine in, in check and stuff like that. Pictures of Lambos, random shit. Pictures of Lambos, we got that, yeah. All right. Well, uh, thanks a shitload to Scott Marceau for filming. Uh, subscribe to this channel if you appreciate this. I, I'm calling this No Jumper. No Jumper is just sort of my, my non-BMX sub-brand that I just use for anything in general. So that's the name of this podcast. Probably confused the shit out of some people because it used to be a rap website. But, hey, Brian, happy to have you on. All right, man. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, you very much. <laughs>